The information contained in this podcast is an expression of opinion and does not constitute investment advice. This is the Gold Money Foundation podcast with Alistair McLeod, keeping you up to date with expert opinion on precious metals and the markets. Hello, this is Alistair McLeod on behalf of the Gold Money Foundation. And it's my great pleasure to have with me today Rick Rule, who will need no introduction at all of Sprott Asset Management. Welcome, Rick. Honoured to be asked. Thank you. We're um, at uh, the Hard Asset Conference, and I see that there are lots and lots of people always queuing up to talk with you. You're obviously fame, famous, or I hope not infamous, but famous. And, I mean, with the price of gold falling below 1600 silver in the doldrums. Are you finding that people are needing a lot of reassurance in this current situation? That really depends on the length of time of their relationship with the gold market or with us. People who are experienced gold investors, uh, people as an example who went through the gold bull markets of the 1970s, may recall if they choose to that there were 10 or 12 instances in that spectacular cyclical, uh, secular bull market where the gold price fell 10 or 15 percent or more. And in particular, that great bull run was broken in 1975 uh, with a decline of 50% in the gold price. One of the things that people must understand is that there can be extremely strong cyclical variation in a secular gold bull market. Uh, obviously, people who were attracted to the gold trade in 2009 or 2010 in the hot markets that were inexperienced in the industry or inexperienced with us uh, have had very, very, very serious issues. For people who have been clients of ours for 20 years or people who have been in the industry for longer periods of time, uh, this is noise, really. Yes, um, I, I, get, I get the feeling that people are probably trying too hard to make money in a situation where really they should be thinking about protecting themselves. Um, and. Uh, yeah, I, people ask me this question, and, and I tend to say to them, well, you know, you should take a position which you can afford and just go on a cruise for th three months, and you'll probably find you're all right when you get back. Is that the sort of feeling that you have as to how people should play gold and silver? That's an extremely astute observation on many levels. Um, my life, as a consequence of my participation in resource financial services, is leveraged to gold. But despite that, I own a reasonable amount of mullion. I don't own the bullion to make money. I buy the bullion as catastrophe insurance. And I can tell you in complete candor that I hope when I'm 90 or however old I am when I become reflective that I haven't made money on my bullion. Uh, if you and own, you've probably still got it. If you own bullion as catastrophe insurance, uh, think about what type of insurance policy you have that you're eager to get paid off on. There aren't many. You know, life insurance, insurance presumes someone dies. Yes. You... What we say to the customer is, to the extent that you're going to own bullion, uh, we own it in a fear trade, not a greed trade. We're not trying to make money. We buy gold stocks not because we think gold will do well, but because that individual company will succeed in answering some unanswered question that will increase the value of that company per se. Very, very, very different goals, but your, your presumptive question at the beginning, I think, is extremely astute. You need to understand what it is you're trying to accomplish with your investments, and then give your investments time to work within the framework of realistic goals. So that, that, I think your observation about um, uh, gold mining companies is, is interesting. Have I got this right, that you would look at gold in terms of a background for uh, a decision taken on other bases. For example, you would look at a company on the basis of its cash position, its management, and so on and so forth, so that any um, change that you expect in the price of gold, or silver as the case may be, becomes a secondary consideration rather than the primary consideration. Have for, I got that? For me, probably a tertiary consideration. Right. Uh, if I think gold is going to go up, I buy gold. That is my primary motivation for buying gold. Yep. Um, for me, I'm a net present value investor and a risk-adjusted net present value speculator. Uh, and I would like, as you say, to get moves in the gold price in the context of equities as icing on the cake. Uh, what I'm interested in in the exploration business is how much gold do these guys have, what am I paying for it, and how much more are they likely to find? 
what is the net present value associated with their exploration activities, and when and how certainly will I receive the benefit of that value. Yeah, absolutely. Now, that makes a lot of sense. And it sort of takes me back to the days when I was um, dealing in, um, in resource stocks. And when they are really out of fashion, that is the time when you can have most fun as an individual because you're just given so much opportunity. And uh, I found that things would go up two or three times before anyone actually thought, well, this is a sector we ought to look at. I mean, the, early, the really early players who know what they're doing really do have an enormous chance to make money. That, that must still be true today, I guess. I think that's accurate. Um, it, it, the way you get in on the ground floor is, of course, creating the ground floor. And so yes. the early players get those opportunities. The other thing, of course, is that you cut your teeth in the sector in London, which was, in its time, the best arbiter of mineral values in the world. Yes. The British and the South Africans always had a sense that because mining industries were declining industries, that what mattered was the free cash flow, turning yes. rocks into money. Yeah. The Canadians and the Americans pioneered this thing of turning rocks into paper, which was a very, very, very dis different discipline. It is. And the, the circumstance that you describe, where you're very, very, very early in a sector, gives you a couple of advantages. The one advantage is that the white shoe crowd, the promoters, have been shaken out by a market bottom. They've gone from mining gold to doing biotech or something else. So there's not as much pollution in the sector. And generally, a much more sober air prevails um, as a consequence of those things and, of course, the fact that there's no competition and pricing is cheap. Uh, those are enormous advantages. And as you suggest, in a cyclical industry, uh, market bottoms offer much more opportunity than market tops. Indeed. Um, I, thinking back to London, in those days, we treated a mine as a wasting asset, I mean, particularly the South African mines, because uh, a South African mine would own the rights to the gold on, on a you know, certain piece of ground, and that was it. And it basically mined it out, and then that was sort of end of story. Or if it reorganized itself, it was a, it was a different story. Um, Moving away from the mining scene, which I know is your favorite topic, and I, I apologize for, for doing this, um, there's a lot of concern at the moment about the global monetary position and so on and so on and so on. What's your take on that? Um, sort of <laughs> well, with reasonably the, briefly. With the caveat that I wouldn't presume to lecture James Turk's audience or Eric Spratt's audience, your, your, your opinion is still valued, Rick. Well, I, I value it, and I'm, I'm delighted that you've asked me the question. I approach uh, these questions, these global, global macro questions, from a credit analyst's point of view. And I look at companies and societies in the same fashion. Uh, is, there, is, is there assets or is their earning stream sufficient to collateralize and service their liabilities? And my difficulty is that increasingly, from my point of view, the answer is no. So you obviously don't buy um, what governments try and tell us, that somehow their accounting is different. Well, I certainly <laughs> buy that their accounting is different. Um, and it may be that they're enough more sophisticated than, than I, that they are right and I am wrong. Um, I think, we t I think we're really talking about laws and nature on this one. I mean, they, yeah. you know. <laughs> well, I, sus I suspect I'm right. Yeah. I mean, I suspect I'm right. As an example, in this country, the inflation statistics that they give you, uh, I'm not a statistician. I just know that these people shop at a different place than I shop. When they are talking about baseline inflation at 2%, that assumes that I don't eat and that I don't drive. And interestingly, it assumes that I don't pay tax. When they talk about a basket of goods and services, I realize there's nothing good about taxes, but the fact that they don't include taxes in the index I think is extremely odd. I wouldn't complain about it if I didn't have to pay the tax, but the fact that that's part of my cost of living and it's not in, included in the index makes me very curious about the composition of the index. If it's a cost of living index, why doesn't it talk about the cost of living? My cost of living doesn't escalate at 2% per annum compounded, and I don't spend much money, so I can't believe in the basket. Uh, that's that's right, and I think I think John Williams has sort of proved the point by recon. I mean, well, it's a slightly different point he's proved by reconstructing the figures to remove the distortions that have been put in over the last what twenty thirty years. You end up with a totally different answer, and with inflation, I don't know, ten percent or whatever the current figure is. 
But presumably there is another problem, and that is that what I buy, being a poor man, is different from what you buy, being a rich man. So we've got different, um, uh, if you like, cost of living increases or changes to cater with. How can you, you can't do an average of, of Rule and McLeod. I mean, it's going to be totally meaningless, let alone a, an average of, you know, a few thousand people or a few hundred thousand or a few million people. I mean, it's a meaningless thing, isn't it? Well, I suspect, given your disclaimer, you're quite a rich man. No. <laughs> a, and although I've made a reasonable sum of money, I'm a miser, I don't spend any money. Well, well you, that, they, but this is personal choice, isn't yes. it? Yes. That, that notwithstanding, your suggestion, I think, is correct. But even in the aggregates, I can't believe that uh, at any demographic level in the United States, that people's uh, cost of living is increasing at the rate that they... Suggest. I agree, I agree. It's an absolute nonsense. And I think, I think developing the theme that's, that, that you've got here, um, if we look at what interest rates, real interest rates really are, they're being wildly understated. And um, criminally understated. Uh, uh, yes, that is a strong word and not incorrect, I have to say. And it, 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 it seems to me that the vested interest in this, from government's point of view, is their cost of borrowing. Um, do you see these very, very negative interest rates leading to a position where they begin to force nominal interest rates up because they are so negative and therefore forces up the government's cost of borrowing and what would the consequences of that be you're guilty if it of, happened? You're guilty of the same linear thinking that I am. Uh, and that goes, uh, if A is true, B is true, C is true, D is true, and E is true, then this outcome is inevitable. Um, and I agree with all that. What I've learned is that there's a difference between inevitable and eminent. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> it's been a vex. Yes, that's um, always the difficult question, uh, isn't it? When is it going to happen? <laughs> a, a vex on my career. Uh, the idea that you have what are uh, patently uh, false interest rates in a patently false interest rate environment uh, has a lot of problems associated with it. The principal problem, from my point of view, is they've effectively declared war on savers. Uh, exactly. I don't think that society should do that uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. I don't think that societies get wealthier through consumption. I think they get wealthier through savings and investment. And so I have a difficulty with that. I also have a difficulty with distortion, of course. The market doesn't care particularly, nor does the government, what I think. Uh, I also believe over time that the uh, government's ability to get away with what they're getting away with goes back to the famous old Ambrose Bierce quote in Devil's Dictionary about the root, root word of confidence being con. The citizenry, I think, would like to believe that the economy can be managed by Bernanke and his ilk. The citizenry seem willing to believe that quantitative easing is something other than counterfeiting. The citizenry seems to believe, and it may be in their interest that there's a war on savers given how few people save. <laughs> but the consequence of this over time, I think is pernicious and dangerous. Uh, I remember in my youth, uh, when you would go to the bank, they'd do something like giving you a toaster to induce you to open the savings account. Uh, fairly soon, you're going to have to give the bank a toaster in order to get them to accept your money. Um, and, and this is an odd and artificial and dangerous construct that people need to be aware of. It will end. I can't tell you when it will end, but it will not end in a happy fashion. I think you bringing in, in uh, the question of savings is an extremely important point. It's actually fundamental to the whole thing. And I like to um, compare the situation between consumer-driven economies and saving, saving savers-driven economies. If you look at Germany and Japan since the last war, they have built themselves into powerhouses on the back of saving, thrift, sound money, whereas we have done exactly the opposite. Why is it, do you think, that the neo-Keynesian, or sorry, the neoclassical economists persist in thinking that pursuing a consumption-driven approach and a weak currency is going to rescue us from our current problems, when so patently it has driven us into these problems in the past? Uh, again, I'm not an economist, or in this case a psychiatrist or sociologist. I think psychiatrist is probably the required yeah. <laughs> discipline. Um, I think... And I, I don't really know the answer to this. I, I think it's politically driven. 
uh, I think most of society would prefer to consume as opposed to to invest. Uh, that part of society that is driven to produce outachieves the rest of society. There's a, a famous lapel pin in the United States that goes, democracy is four coyotes and a lamb voting on what's for lunch. <laughs> uh, and, and the lamb in this particular context, of course, is the producer and the saver. There's a widespread discontent in the United States with the so-called 1%. And there are certainly elements within the 1%, that element which is tied into Wall Street and politics, that have enjoyed uh, gains that had nothing to do with their productivity, that had to do rather with their political connections. But the rest of the 1% uh, are generally people who have saved and produced. They have made these fortunes because they have generated utility for other people through the provision of goods or services that cause those people to willingly give the 1% their money. In other words, they have created value. And the idea that you vilify people as a consequence of the fact that they created value I think is as pernicious as the war on savings. The yes. economic miracle that has been the United States in the last couple hundred years has been as a consequence of the tolerance of success. Uh, the ethos that social mobility was available and acceptable and that achievement was a positive as opposed to a negative thing, that the acquisition of wealth on a private basis was emblematic of your contribution to society in and of itself. And I think to the extent that we diminish those feelings in the United States, we wreck what America is actually about. Doug Casey makes the point, of, makes the point that uh, America isn't a physical place, it's a state of mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, it's becoming increasingly inconvenient to be of that state of mind in the place that's called the United States of America, which is very unfortunate. Yes, um, I think I think I think that's got to be right. I, the, the Austrian analysis, which is which is really what you're saying, is that it is you have in society progress that can only come from the entrepreneur satisfying the needs and wants of people, and the whole basis of the division of labour, whereby you do something better than I do, so that I will pay you for what you do better than I do, and hopefully you will pay me. For Right. for the things that I do better than you do. Right. Um, that is the whole structure and the whole basis of society. And we, we've, we've got to a point now where uh, government is um, not just intruding on that relationship that we all have with each other, but it is actually destroying that relationship. It seems to have gone too far. Would you, would you think that's uh, a sort of fair summation, summation of it? I think it's gone substantially too far. Um, yeah. I, there, I can find no fault in that statement. Uh, again, Ambrose Bierce, I think, in Devil's Dictionary, defined um, elections as advanced auctions of stolen property. Yes. Uh, and that was probably a very cynical definition at the time that he wrote it. But getting but less he, cynical as time yeah, goes on. I mean, I'm not familiar with the intricacies of, as an example, British or European politics, but certainly politics as I observe them in the United States or in California, it's very clear that the game is defending yourself from predation by one group of society while attempting to hire legislators on your behalf who prey on other parts of society on your behalf. And the idea that economic uh, competition takes place in a political or indirect realm rather than in the market, I think is very, very, very dangerous. Yes, that's right. I think that, the, 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 you know, the sort of the political realm uh, it should be very separate from the economic realm, or if it intrudes, then the true cost should be apparent to all. Uh, and of course, this is the great thing about inflation. You can, uh, you can rob the savers without them even knowing about it, and you can market the proceeds of your robbery as a triumph in provision of services. Correct. So, uh, so this, is, this is where government is. Now, we've had uh, the sort of the credit crisis, um, you know, Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers back in 2000. Eight, nine, whenever it was. Um, and since then, it's morphed into a sovereign debt crisis. I mean, all this was inevitable. I think those of us who were ahead of the game, really by understanding not neoclassical economics, but Austrian economics, it was all predictable, predicted, and so on. So when things happen, it's just a question of timing. You recognize it when it happens. So, so okay, next stage. We're continuing along that path. Um, 
you made the comment that um, it's impossible to, to tell about timing, which I agree with you. But it does seem inevitable, doesn't it, that um, you know, the European situation, for example, is going to be followed by a, uh, a similar deterioration but a different path because they can't print money in the UK, in the US, and Japan, and so on. What are your feelings about that? Do you think there's just going to be a time when it sort of switches over and um, the same problems arise in the US? Oh, certainly. But it'll be differently manifest because they can print money. It's just they can, they can maybe disguise it a bit, de a bit more effectively than the Europeans can because they had nothing to hide behind. As an American, I have to say I hope it's true. Um, the uh, set of circumstances that evolves out of the devolution of the system that we have now will likely be quite messy. Uh, or, or if it occurred is what I should say, it would be quite messy. And at age 59, to the extent that they could postpone that until I was gone, uh, I could see that as a good thing. My friend Doug Casey says it'll be extremely interesting, and I hope to watch it on a broad screen TV from somewhere else. Do you think they can really keep this going for another 30 years? I don't, I, no, I don't. I don't, but I hope they can. Um, I, I hope they can. I, going back to the sense that the uh, con is possible because most people want to believe in it, I, I suspect that this goes on, unfortunately, until it doesn't. And I don't know what the triggering event would we be. We don't know when. I know it's the trigger and it's the when. I, I suspect it? that they came fairly close to losing control in 2008. I mean, I don't know anybody who's really truly in a position to tell me that. Uh, I have heard anecdotal, you wouldn't call it evidence. I've heard suggestions that that was the case. What occurs to me is that, as an example, the current strength in the U.S. dollar Again, as a credit analyst, not as a trader, not as an economist, I wouldn't lend the U.S. government money. I when I look at either. the on-balance sheet liabilities and the off-balance sheet liabilities and their ability to service the debt, I wouldn't lend them the money. So uh, I remember it, when the various third world contagions happened, the Southeast Asian contagion, the Brazilian incident with the Brady's bond, the U.S. bailed people out. That's what we did. The U.S. recently aided in terms of liquidity with some of the European financial reorganization. Well, who's going to bail us out? Uh, when I look at the U.S. dollar, when I look at U.S. Treasury securities, when I look at the U.S. economy, and I watch the world financial power, powers declaring U.S. Treasury securities the risk off trade, I shake my head. Either I'm wrong or they're wrong. Doug Casey, again, famously said, the U.S. dollar is an IOU nothing, but the euro is a who owes you nothing. <laughs> so I guess the situation that we're in is the fact that the U.S. dollar, while it may be the worst currency in the world, is somehow better than the rest anyway. At the very least, it's probably the most liquid lie in the world. And one lesson that we learned from 2008 is that liquidity was God. And I think one of the hangovers, one of the aftermaths of the 2008 liquidity crisis is although you don't have faith in U.S. Treasuries and you don't have faith in the U.S. currency, you have more faith in them than you do other instruments. I personally believe that faith is misguard misguided, and I honestly hope I'm wrong. Well, there's, the, um, there's this extraordinary situation, really, where uh, gold is the risk on trade and the U.S. dollar is the risk off trade. It's upside down, is it not? I think that's, I think that's true. I, I think one of the things that's happened is that some of the gold participants haven't been people that bought gold in the context of its traditional attributes as a medium of exchange. So, so, so of hedge funds and people like precisely, that. Yeah. Precisely. And one of the things that happens to those people is if they buy large amounts of gold and they use short-term credits, uh, from, in particular, European banks, and there's a slowdown in interbank lending, those credit lines get cut, and that gold comes on the market, which I suspect is one of the things that we've seen in the last two or three weeks. Obviously, the European banking system 
has been under continuing strain. And That's my suspicion is that there has been a reduction in interbank credit flows, and as a consequence, there has been, I'm, I'm making this up, I don't know it to be true, uh, reduction it's a possibility, in isn't it? credit yes. availability to some of the hotter holders of gold. It's, it's certainly a possibility. Um, I, I've been interested in your comments on this one because I was looking at it at a slightly more narrow um, uh, lens. And I was looking at COMEX and I was seeing that the, um, the commercials have been reducing their net shorts substantially over a period of time. And that is a continuing process. And I think if I was a commercial, but I'm not, and I'm not advised by my economist who will be a neoclassical economist, so this is a slightly um, uh, off-the-wall thought, it seems to me that it would make an awful lot of sense for the market to reduce its short positions as much as possible. They're doing that, but what I don't know is whether it's being driven by them doing that deliberately or by the last gasp of speculation being wrung out of the market. Do you have a feel for that at all? I don't. Um, the, uh, how would you say, the psychology of mass markets is something I've never been particularly adept at analyzing. This is the credit analyst in you coming out again. Yes, precisely. Mm. I'm, um, I don't own a television. Uh, I don't go to movies. So my ability to understand the value of a story in terms of the way that it would play out in the reactions of the mob is not something I'm very good at analyzing. I've tried to do it over 30 years, but I have found myself to be fairly unsuccessful. Eric Sprott, by contrast, who I work with, is extremely good at this. He's a good student of markets, and he understands this fairly well. Uh, one of the lovely parts about my tie-up with Eric is I don't have to pretend to be able to do it any longer. I call him and ask him. Uh, so I really don't know the answer to that. I can, I can tell you the motivations of some of the commercials that I know personally. Uh, I, I could tell you my motivations. I could tell you it affect the collective motivations of my customers. But I understand that the part of the market that I understand intimately is such a small part of the market that's probably irrelevant in the context of your question. Yes, right. Well, I think we've rather run out of time. It has been fascinating for me to have the opportunity to talk to you, Rick, and I'm very grateful that you've taken time out from doing this. There's probably a queue out of the door of people waiting to talk to you, so I'd better let you go. But again, thank you very much indeed for joining me in this podcast. My pleasure. Hope to be invited back. Subscribe to the Gold Money newsletter at www.goldmoney.com to receive email updates on new articles, videos, and iTunes podcasts from our Gold Research section.